Hello, I'm Haxi Myers Belk, and a very warm welcome to this edition of the 51%, a show dedicated to the women reshaping our world. Coming up in the show, a new near total abortion ban comes into effect in Florida, while lawmakers in Arizona repeal a Civil War era ban on terminations. Those twin moves once again highlighting reproductive rights as a crucial battleground ahead of the upcoming US election. And as birth rates continue to fall across the world, I'll be speaking to fertility expert Dr. Helen O'Neill about how women can be better supported as they decide if, and crucially when, to start a family. A new highly restrictive abortion ban in Florida makes it illegal to terminate a pregnancy before many women even realize they've missed a period. Amid a dizzying patchwork of abortion legislation across US states, following the overturning of Roe v. Wade under President Trump almost two years ago, the issue of reproductive rights is increasingly galvanizing voters. Aurore Chloé Dupuis explains. No, you really did, though. You, you really abortion, a crucial battleground for the presidential vote. Do not abort your babies. These laws are being written by people who don't really understand medical care. Don't claim to have women's rights. You don't care less about the woman in the world. Florida used to be a safe haven for abortion in the southern United States. Today's a very dark day in Florida's history. Reproductive rights might just be the issue that mobilizes young and undecided voters. Our voices, whether you agree or disagree, should be heard. According to the latest survey, 64% of voters nationwide, including in Republican-controlled states, support the right to abortion. Only 9% believe that abortion should be completely illegal. Florida was the last state in southern United States without a near-total ban. But now, women are no longer allowed to have an abortion after six weeks, when it's often too early to know whether they're pregnant or not. Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to Jacksonville, accusing Donald Trump personally of depriving women of their reproductive freedom. Because of Donald Trump, more than 20 states have abortion bans. So here's what a second Trump term looks like. More bans, more suffering, less freedom. But we are not going to let that happen. Trump, on the other hand, hardly mentions the issue in political meetings. On social media, he says he's leaving it up to each state to determine abortion access. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. While voters are also concerned with other major issues, the economy, foreign policy or immigration, many are turned off by the prospect of a Trump-Biden rematch. Some might not vote at all, so reproductive rights might just motivate them to cast their ballot on the 5th of November. Women are having fewer and fewer children. In 2023, the birth rate here in France was down 7% on the previous year. Analysts point to a range of social and economic factors, but those discussions tend to avoid the often taboo subject of female biology. I'm joined in the studio now by Dr. Helen O'Neill, a lecturer in reproductive and molecular genetics at UCL in London. She's also the CEO of Hertility, which is a company that offers at-home testing for a range of reproductive conditions. It's great to have you with us today, Helen. Mm -hmm. Now, women are having uh, fewer babies and they're having them later in life. How much is this due to infertility? That is, women wanting kids but not being able to have them. We have to look at the different reasons for infertility. And at present, one of the leading causes of infertility in women is age-related. We have a limited time in which we can have children. And when we leave it too late, we are unfortunately then far at far higher risk of infertility. But to really quantify which of the different outputs are leading to reduced fertility is actually quite difficult. It's a series of a combination of reproductive conditions, our lifestyle factors, leaving it too late, but also not forgetting that male fertility rates are really falling too. We often just look to female fertility and almost look to blame, but actually 50% of the equation is male factor infertility. And I think the two really compound this issue of declining fertility rates. And do you think this is something that people at large are talking about openly, or is there something uh, akin to what might be termed a fertility taboo? 
there's definitely a fertility taboo. It is the type of conversation that, especially when it involves two parties, it's very complex, it's very personal. Moreover, people's journeys are quite individual. You don't really realize how much time has gone on because you only have an opportunity to get pregnant once a month. So each month, couples or women are faced with that disappointment when their period arrives, when they're actively trying to conceive. And you end up after a series of months and then sometimes years before you've realized actually this is something that is a problem. And do you think this is about a lack of education? Why is it, do you think, that women uh, don't know as much as they possibly could to about their own bodies, their own fertility? This is completely due to a lack of education. We are not equipped with the tools that we need to understand basic physiological and reproductive functions. And again, this comes from both sides. We should be educating boys and girls, men and women, about the limitations of fertility, but also how fertility works. We just published a report that was based on 325,000 women and realized that 47% of women who were actively trying to conceive did not know when their fertile window was. So I think it's a bigger problem than we even want to admit. Yes, we can talk about early education when you're in school, but there's that ongoing education about the basics of, of fertility and reproductive health that we are all lacking. Now, egg freezing is becoming increasingly popular as some women and employers strive to put fertility on ice. Is that something that you would advocate? I disagree with the idea that we should be promoting the idea of egg freezing, certainly among a workforce. At Hertility, we really want to turn the argument on its head and say, as an employer, if you are going to offer something that is deemed to be a positive, then why wouldn't you offer reproductive health screening to each of your employees to say, actually, these are the people for whom they may actually struggle and these are the people for whom they need to monitor their reproductive health and their fertility. We're saying people should track their ovaries over their calories because we, if we had better insights from a younger age about our own fertility, we'd be able to make better informed decisions rather than just putting your eggs on ice. Now, here in France, single women and same-sex couples have been allowed to access IVF treatment for just over a year and a half now. Before that, it had only been open to heterosexual couples experiencing fertility problems. And this change in the law has led to more and more French women choosing to become single parents. Dr O'Neill, do stay with us as we watch this report by Olivia salazar Winspear. Natasha's moving one step closer to her dream of becoming a mum. She's got an appointment at the hospital in Amiens because she's decided to have a baby alone at 26 years old. I think that the desire to have a child is so strong and rooted in me for such a long time now that it couldn't wait any longer. There's no Prince Charming at the moment. I was looking for someone, but I realized I was looking for a father more than a partner, really, and that sort of relationship can't really work. So I thought, why shouldn't I just go it alone? She qualifies for IVF in the public health system, since French lawmakers extended its provision to single women around two years ago. She'll be using donor sperm, she's chosen his skin colour, the same as hers, but didn't specify any other criteria, even though the law allows for certain preferences. Half of the requests here are made by single women. They want to start a family independently. They don't want to deal with the pressure of waiting to meet the right person. Natasha already made certain choices to prepare for parenthood. A stable job, she bought an apartment and underwent psychotherapy to make sure she was making the right choice for her and her future child. Over the years, family structures have changed. The couple's no longer automatically at its centre. Recent sociological studies say women who choose to be single mothers create alternative support networks. This association reaches out to women who've had children alone by choice, offering advice and solidarity. Margot's the mother of twins and sees her single status as an advantage. I prefer being on my own because I can choose their names, how they're brought up, to breastfeed or not, their education. It's great. Yet this option's certainly not an easy one. It's estimated that in France, a child costs on average €9,000 per year, a significant amount when there's only one breadwinner, not to mention the many logistical and emotional challenges that fall to just one caregiver. 
Je regrette pas et je ne regretterai jamais. I don't regret it and I'll never regret it. The fact remains, however, that it's difficult. It will always be difficult. All those little moments of happiness, the difficult times, not having someone there to talk to about it on a day-to-day -day basis, that's very hard. Natasha's first round of IVF didn't work, yet she's determined to join the ranks of these women who go it alone by choice. Dr O'Neill, is choosing to become a solo parent an approach you think more women should start considering? I do, actually. I think that we are really in a generation of people who are really in relationships that last quite a long time because neither party or one or the other is not ready, a term that we are coining a delationship, where somebody is delaying a decision to settle down, delaying a decision to have children at the cost of somebody else's reproductive future. Before, when people settled down, it was at least five, six, seven years earlier. We're now seeing that both the rates of marriage and, and the first time that everyone has children are much later. And so those decisions can seriously impact actually whether somebody can have children or not. So taking that decision into your own hands, I think, is more power to any woman. Now, some people might see your approach as too essentialist, conservative even, putting so much focus on a woman's fertility over say, her career or her hobbies. What do you say to that sort of criticism? I disagree entirely. I think that we have the opportunity to nurture all aspects of the things that we love in life. But when you give somebody an opportunity that is taken away from them, and that is having a family, then that can have devastating consequences. And with the high rates of infertility and the high rates of IVF babies, what we really see is that actually providing the resources to allow people to know whether they're fertile or not gives them a choice, and that's the most important aspect. Dr. Helen O'Neill, lecturer in reproductive and molecular genetics at UCL in London, thank you so much you. for speaking to us here on France 24 today. Well, that's all we have time for for this edition of The 51%. Thank you so much for watching and see you next week.